Hi, everybody. Welcome to Your Ancestors Are Calling, Shifting Your Perspective on Anxiety and Depression to Heal Generational Wounds. I'm Dottie, and I'm hoping with this summit that we can shake a little bit of the stigma around the anxiety and depression labels, those body and mind states, and learn that if we heal for ourselves, we can also heal for our ancestors and generations to come. So today with me, I have Cater. And he's an internationally known ceremonialist and cowrie shell diviner. He's a healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, Cater has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his depth of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and ritual healing methods from around the world. Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council, an organization offering nature-based treatments and professional training programs. Cater is a member of International Wilderness Guides Council, and he's known for his ability to blend many creative and expressive forms of depth psychology and therapy with more ancient methods of healing through vision quest ceremonies, sweat lodge ceremonies, rites of passage experiences, and personalized ceremonies and rituals in his work with individuals, with couples, groups, and communities. Cater lives in the highlands of Western North Carolina where he joins us from today. Welcome, Cater. Thank you so much for joining me and being a part of this. Exciting to be here. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. So your bio on your video is entitled A Blessing from the Ancestors and a Gift of Medicine Remembered. Would you please share with us um, your personal, some of your personal story and uh, how it relates to the topic of our summit today? Yeah, when I, when I think about my personal story, and this is something that I've, an awareness I've gathered throughout my life that, um, so I was given the names of two uh, uncles that both died early and prematurely uh, in their lives. Looking back now, I can see I was hardwired and imprinted with this need to reconcile ancestral trauma and dilemma. Um, in connection that way. So um, one of them being that uh, my name, Cater Stevenson, and my middle name, Steve. When Steve, my uncle Steve, who died long before I was born, he died in a car wreck when he was 19. Um, and then my cousin Kate, I mean, my uncle Cater, who also died long before I was born, died in a house fire when he was around 35 or so. And, um, and Steve died of a head injury. Um, in that car wreck. And so when I was born, and then um, when I got to the age that Cater was when he died is when I uh, did my first vision quest and essentially went through a whole transition of identity and, and reorganization of uh, how I saw myself and where I was headed. So, um, and then knew that this ceremony was something that I would wanted to embrace and felt like I was here to to bring was this uh, connection with this death and rebirth passage called vision quest or vision fasting ceremony that's done. Um, so that's a little bit, there's a, a lot more, but it's a little bit of how I kind of wove into this, this arena through first through training, traditional training, education, psychotherapy, and, and then quickly blending into that world, start to blend uh, clinical psychotherapy with ritual and ceremony. You come to uh, what I would call the borderlands where one meets the other, where psychology stops in its explanation uh, and indigenous or shamanic awareness and uh, paradigms pick up. And so I ran into that borderline, into that place um, in my late 30s as I was doing this work with people um, where things that would begin to happen in uh, preparing people for ceremony by doing this intensive ritual process work, all of a sudden were not explainable by consensus reality, let alone psychotherapy. Um, 
and that's when I began to bridge my, it's like, well, if, if psychotherapy can't explain to me why is it this person just blew this long stream of black smoke out of their mouth during this intensive piece of work that we were doing about ancestral healing, then I need to go learn from people that can. And so that's when I began my work with uh, some of my other teachers in the indigenous world, Will Rocking Bear, Mel Delma Somme. So I quickly learned that w when you come to that borderland, that, that they're um, all of a sudden the, the rules that simply apply to consensus reality or models of psychotherapy and psychology no longer apply. And there's a whole new set of understandings that are effective. Um, and so leaving out lots and lots of stories, but that's kind of the trajectory of how I ended up here. <laughs> Oh, wonderful. I love that you explored it instead of denying it. I, you know, having that traditional training that you had, you still were like, there's there's more to this. And I love that. Right. Well, you know, I, the, the, the person I was doing that work with what, that I described, we were in, in, in some intensive ritual process healing work where I was employing depth psychology and body-centered psychotherapy work, but we're using ritual and ceremony as the container. When I looked into the psychological texts and psychiatric texts of understanding, they would talk about this thing um, for dissociative identity people called the uninvited guest. And that's where psychology stops. They don't really go into talking about what that is, where that, well, at least back then, maybe they do now. Um, and so my inquiring mind says, well, what is it? Where is it from? And where am I sending it? <laughs> yeah. And because I need to know what this is and what we're working with here. And so quickly, you know, the indigenous shamanic perspective picks up right there and has a whole other way of uh understanding what that's about and what how you work with it, um, and how you work with the, the person that's in front of you. Mm -hmm. Also understanding that you're also working um with the ancestors or with what I call the unwell ancestors, the unwell dead. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really, it's, it's um, I have that, uh, having Scorpio in my astrological chart, I was not one to really want to let go. <laughs> it's like, no, I need to know more here. What, what's underneath that rock? <laughs> right. There's more depth and more depth and more depth. <laughs> right. right there with you. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. That's really, it's so fascinating just endlessly fascinating. What's well, interesting, um, this <clears throat> paradigm in, in Western psychological thinking, um, and again, that's good to see that's changing. I've been in the field for 30 plus years, so I've seen a lot of changes in even how that's held, but um, by, by uh, most people it's held that, you know, we're, we're born into this world and we have certain basic aptitudes and developed interests and um, based on that as we grow up we will get an occupational handbook that we can go through and pick out what it is that we're going to do um, and it works nicely if you fit into that if you fit into that model um, and in that model um, it's it's a model what I call better and less than because in that model you can be better and you can be less and um, and so it builds this illusion of scarcity and, and panic and anxiety and depression, all these other things. In an indigenous model, it would be something like you going and, and sitting down with uh, uh, the old medicine man or old medicine woman in, in the tribe and, uh, and say that you're pregnant and the old medicine man or old medicine woman say, well, this this one that's coming into the world is coming here because they're bringing a gift that we need. And they've also made agreements with certain ancestors that are connected with this gift or this medicine. And so when they arrive here, our, our job is to kind of keep pulling that out, help bring that out of them as opposed to filling them up. Mm -hmm. So identity is not something that you discover. It's something that you remember. Um, I love that. In this, uh, in this way that um, coming into the world 
um, under that paradigm of thinking, you can't be better the same way you can't be less. Mm -hmm. You can be you and the world needs you to be you because you brought something here we need. And so it's a whole different shift of paradigm. And then the initiatory passages, the rites of passage, or these, these uh, developmental rituals and ceremonies are designed to help activate the memory of that medicine, the memory of those relationships with the other world, and, and then how to bring that into this world. Um, so it's really a whole different paradigm of thinking where better and less doesn't even exist. Yeah. Um, and therefore scarcity is simply an illusion based on living out of balance with the natural world. Right. Um, so beautiful. We need more of it. I'm glad you're bringing it into our culture. It's important work. Yeah, it's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah, it is. Um, so will you offer us your perspective on healing and its relationship to the realm of the ancestors? So think of, um, which is a Western way of thinking, which is this kind of past life, future life. It's a way of organizing our, our mind in a linear way. As my uh, native teacher, he said, well, we don't say past, we just say other. Meaning that it's right there. It's beside you. If you know how to turn your attention and just your, your focus, uh, you're aware of it. Um, and its influence in our current life. Um, my thought is that, you know, we come into this world not only carrying this gift of healing in some way, this gift of medicine, um, but we also come into particular family systems uh, to further the, the evolutionary healing arc of that particular family. Um, and also to, to reconcile the, the turmoil that may have been left by those that have come. Um, so this, uh, not only do we have ancestral helping spirits that we're connected with, that we work with, um, consciously or unconsciously, um, but there's also this realm of the unwell. And part of the realm of the unwell is right here where you and I are in this this uh, living human world. Um, so, and the other part of the unwell realm is uh, on the other side. So that in this, uh, one of these old Irish proverbs that I really like that says that the, the troubles in this world can only be healed from the other world. And the troubles that are over there in the other world, well, they can only be healed from this world. And so it implies this reciprocal relationship of connection and healing and communication that's necessary. It also implies that, the, that being dead doesn't make one an ancestor. It just makes one dead. No more than being alive makes one healthy, conscious, and well. It just makes one alive. And so there's this whole area uh, between the well-living and the ancestral bright and shiny ones. Uh, of unwellness that just keeps perpetuating across generations. So in, in, uh, we have terms now that, that we introduced into modern culture like epigenetics is a way of saying that differently. Um, in um, psychotherapy, psychology, we have what's called family constellation work, which is another way of saying that differently. Um, in indigenous cultures, it's just what we're just working with the dead, we're going to help them heal, and the, the bright and shiny ancestor is going to help us heal, and we need each other. And, and it wasn't uh, it was, uh, a conceptualized idea of reality. It was a palpable uh, relational experience, um, not just a theoretical uh, New Age concept of how it works. Um, and so... Um, so to engage not only, uh, and the other perspective is that when there's trouble here in this world, it means the trouble already exists over there. And so in, in indigenous reality, culture, perspective, when there's trouble we're dealing with here, we don't look here first. We turn our attention there through ritual, through divination, through, uh, other means to see what's happening or what happened in that other realm that's still 
in a state of unwellness, unrest, because that turmoil is now our turmoil. And if we don't help them heal, they can't help us heal. Mm. Um, I can tell you a, a, a couple of quick stories about healing across that divide. Um, so I was working in a, a wilderness, uh, therapeutic wilderness camp, uh, recovery center. So it meant that if a teenager was sitting in front of me, that they had gone down the road of uh, alcohol and drugs as a way to, what I would say, a way to self-initiate themselves. Um, when the ceremonies of rites of passage don't exist, youth will create them. And these ideas of uh, this need to brush up against the sacred is is a, to brush up against that which is dangerous. That's where the sacred lives at those thresholds. And so you have teens that are, living this out without initiated elders through alcohol, drugs, and other addictive, obsessive, compulsive behaviors. So parents brought their son in to this wilderness recovery center and the, the young man's getting outfitted. And I'm sitting in the family therapy room with these two, two adults and um, they start telling me this story. And they just tell me this story about this young man who now at 17, is, is using alcohol, using drugs, is depressed, they don't know what's going on, and they don't know how it happened because not too long ago he was doing great in school, you know, involved in sports, um, very social, and it just seemed to, you know, on a dime just turn, and they had no explanation, and they were really scared for their son. And so I'm listening to this, and I'm beginning to wonder, you know, so it's not the usual there's no indication of any trauma, any accident, anything losses that I can see that they know about. Um, so I shift my perspective to include um, the other realm um, and standing beside the mother who's sitting in front of me, standing beside her on her right, um, I see the image of this old man. And I just noticed that. And then as I'm talking to the father who's sitting to my right, Standing on his left, I see this another, this other man standing there, and so I get real curious who these two are, and so I ask uh, mom, "Tell me about your family," and she starts to tell me about her mother and father, I mean her mother, and so I said, "Well, tell me about your dad and your granddad," and oh, uh, well, my granddad hung himself when he was around nineteen. I said, "Wow, that's horrible. I'm really sorry to hear that." There wasn't a lot of emotional expression with the reporting of it. Um, we finished talking and turned to dad. Similar thing, he told me, he wanted to tell me about his mom and his grandmother. I said, well, tell me about your dad and your granddad. My head drops. Well, my dad shot himself uh, when I was around um, 18. You could feel, even I feel the grief in it. And, uh, and I think, okay, now I know who these two people are. And now I know what's going on with this kid who just turned 17 is that this hungry ghost of unresolved grief has now landed on him. Mm -hmm. um, the, these uh, unwell spirits who died in states of you know, depression or anxiety or whatever it was that caused them have latched onto this young man. Um, and there's a lot of grief here that has not been acknowledged. Um, we often find grief at the, unexpressed grief is often the source of a lot of illness and turmoil. Um, and so in further conversations with the young man later in the program, he you know, would talk about this and he would say, yeah, they, they tell me I'm just like my granddad. Or, and so we were able to talk about the grief and he was able to feel it, mom and dad could own it. And then eventually he began to get better. Um, and it, so this idea that, um, I'll never forget the day that, that my teacher, Rocky Bear said to me, I was sharing a story with him. He said, are those your thoughts? Are those your feelings? And I thought, you know, psychologically minded, I thought, if he's asking me, maybe not. <laughs> At the time, I was young and I thought he wouldn't be asking me this question. It's not, this is not an easy answer, probably. <laughs> um, and so, you know, in, in indigenous reality, shamanic reality, you learn um, that these unresolved energies maintain themselves in family systems. Um, if you study physics, 
you know, and energy cannot be created or destroyed. It simply changes form. Um, so we know that that's science. So that would make sense. This energy is, is moves through this family system. The Buddhists might call it a hungry ghost. And so, um, healing that does not include an understanding of, of working with ancestors at any level um, isn't often complete. Um, it, it, can, it can show back up. Um, and then a reverse story, this one a little bit shorter. So this is one of working with the other world to help someone in this world. And it, it, uh, it came to surprise me so I, was, uh, I have a friend that uh, has this real estate company, and every now and then they'll call me in and say, you know, would you go take a look at this house? Something's really off at, up at, with it, and I don't know what it is. And uh, so I went to take a look at this house, nice house, beautiful neighborhood, beautiful home. It was up for sale, and it had been staged. Nobody was living in it, so it was staged with the furniture. And the only information I knew is that um, – a woman lived in the house with her family and she died of cancer. That's all in it. And she died in the house. So that was my first thought. I said, okay, well, maybe something's unresolved. Maybe the husband's not done holding on to this. Um, and so I go in the house and I go into the room and, that I know that the lady died in. And it was this sun room. And I thought, this is an incredibly beautiful room. It feels great. I thought, you know, if I was to die in this, I'm wonderful. Like I couldn't pick up on anything right away. And then I walked upstairs and there were five bedrooms in this upstairs. And my attention went to this place on the carpet between these two back bedroom doors. Um, and I noticed it and then went around and then finally made my way back there and stood there. Um, and I felt this wave of grief. Um, and I turned around and I noticed um, where I was standing, I could see into all of the children's bedrooms from that one spot. And I, in the image of her standing there with this diagnosis, having not yet shared this, I felt this, oh, this tremendous pain. Um, and then I did a divination. Sometimes I'll do divinations on land or houses. And so I did a uh, divination on the house. And... Um, saw the story it was more of a story of this woman didn't know her name and she had this she was in relationship with a, a younger woman her um like a mentor she was like a mentor to this younger woman and the younger woman was in a state of really turmoil relationship turmoil i would say and so i kept seeing this and um and then the message and i checked in with the ancestor spirit that was we felt very present in the room I said, is there anything you need and it's like no she's perfectly fine um, and it felt real like a woman of high integrity and, and respect and honor. Um, and uh, the other things that came to me was um, the, word, the name Emily and the words be brave um, and the word melody. I'm giving you I'm giving you this uh, quick synopsis of what took three hours to do <laughs> and um, in communication and. Um, so I thought, okay, I don't know who Emily is. Maybe I think the husband knows who this person is. And be brave. Not sure what that's about. Maybe it's about courage. And as soon as I said courage, it said, no, be brave. I said, okay. So communicated the message to the real estate person. Turned out there was an Emily. Um, oh, a song came to me during that called Brave by Sarah Borales. Those out there listening to this might want to listen to that song. Because it sounds like it's a song speaking to a young woman who's in relationship turmoil. And it's like, it's time to have your voice, speak your truth. Like the days of, of silence are over. Um, and that was the message that came in. So I delivered that message to the real estate person who delivered it to the husband. He said, there is somebody named Emily my, my wife used to work with. And he found her, took her the song, gave her the information. She had a big cry. And she said, I was about to marry that person and I got out because I decided he wasn't good for me. And that was, uh, that was to me, I even asked permission to be able to share this story um, with the 
with those people. I said, this is a fascinating story that I got to be a part of yeah. um, coming from that side to this side. Wow. Um, yeah. Powerful. So, yeah. So those are two, two stories, one from here to there and one from there to here. And, um, that both very powerful. <laughs> yes. Amazing. Really good stories. Yeah. Um, can you share, um, well, actually, what are some specific rituals that uh, attend to the turmoil that exists between the ancestors and the living? Mm. <laughs> I'm reminded of my dad who used to say all the time, this is a lack of communication. <laughs> I think maybe that's it. Maybe that's that's the first thing. It's like um, and then relationship and communication. Um, and we have this way of, looking at that as being not even available or um, necessary, except for those of us who talk to our moms or dads or grandparents all the time, even after they're gone. It's like, that's, we think, well, that's very real. But to employ them, as uh, I say, in the world of the ancestors, unemployment is extremely high. And there's so much work over here and they're confused about how come we're not contacting them more. <laughs> Um, so rituals, uh, rituals that open the way of connection often, uh, involve grief and unacknowledged grief, grief rituals, um, uh, ancestralization or ancestor grief rituals, um, would be, uh, methods of opening those doorways of communication. Um, and uh, grief often has a lot of different uh, out front images. Sometimes it starts look. It's in the beginning. It can look like anger, or or disgust, or whatever it is. Um, there's this old saying in Africa that says, uh, "An angry man is a man on the road to grief, and the sooner he gets there, the better for him and for us." Anger, because we know we're just helping them down that road till they get to the tears, and the tears are what connect. Um, now, I've recently lost my mother this year, my dad many years ago. Um, and when somebody asked, uh, maybe 15, 20 years later after my dad had died, said, do you still feel tearful? Will it ever stop? Will the tears ever stop? And I said, I hope not, uh, because it's the tears that enable me to connect um, the way water does. So grief rituals, um, ancestral, what, what's uh, uh, called ancestral line clearing work, where you're doing work to help clear uh, the turmoil in one's ancestral line between where the well ancestors are and well, where I am. Um, sometimes there's a lot of folks in there that I don't necessarily want to talk with. <laughs> I want to go way back. Um, so there's this need to kind of clear and attend to the turmoil within the line and their methods and rituals of that. Um, to, to give, um, to give a, a, an, a, an example of something that you can do um, through uh, either journeying or um, through the assistance of someone that does this kind of work, to connect uh, with an ancestral helping spirit. And there's a, a litmus test that, uh, that you can always use to determine if you're who you're talking with is an ancestral helping spirit. And that is, because um, I get a lot of people that will tell me, oh, I'm talking with this spirit, that spirit. So it's like, well, I don't know that you want to be talking with them. It'd be like going into a bar and inviting everybody home to give you some advice. <laughs> Um, so one is that um, ancestral helping spirits don't need anything from us. They're just, it's like a grandmother, grandfather, they're just there to help. It's like, how, how can I help? They're not going to have a laundry list of things they want us to do and all these things. It's like, that's not one you want to be talking with. Um, so in doing this work to connect with a true ancestral helping spirit through, uh, through journeying, um, and if one doesn't know how to do that, there are uh, plenty of uh, practitioners that can kind of direct them in that way, teach them how to do it or do it with them. 
Um, and then once having that connection, um, my thing is to bring it into this world and do a ritual enactment of that. So that connection is about enlisting that support, getting to them and calling on their assistance to help heal the line, the brokenness, uh, the turmoil that lives in the line between where they are and where I am. So that's done in journey. That relationship is important. A ritual enactment is to take that uh, work and ritually enact it in this realm. Um, and so one uh, particular ritual enactment of ancestral line healing that I say is to get a, uh, a rose quartz. Rose quartz is about this frequency of the heart, of love. Um, unpolished is best. And then to get uh, a strand of um, red yarn, fairly thick red yarn that represents your bloodline. That rose quartz represents uh, the bright and shiny ancestral realm of love and wisdom and support. Um, and then to get an ancestor ring. Now, this is not a ring that would be um, uh, necessarily passed down through your family. Um, it would be, it could be any ring that speaks to you of you, of relationship because rings are about relationship. When you, when you see it or find it or it's given to you it's like yeah that speaks to me of relationship with my ancestors you have the stone the the yarn that's the the bloodline in the ring um to uh on best best done in my opinion on a um the eve of a new moon which is the dark moon for those that i know the new moon is not the crescent the new moon are those three dark nights it's a time of newness of planting seed like a beginning so go out on the first eve of the new moon to place the, uh, to do an invocation that you're calling on the ancestral helping spirit of this particular one, this one you've connected with, um, to assist you in healing the turmoil of whatever it is in your life that comes from that line. Um, you tie one end of the yarn to the, the rose quartz and the other end, 13, I would say 13 feet of yarn, the other end to the ring, Place it in running water, small stream, um, so that the water flows uh, from the stone downstream to the ring. Um, and then uh, some milk and honey. It's about sweetness and healing. To pour the milk and honey on the, the stone. Um, and the milk and honey, the sweetness and the healing, essentially runs down the, the line to the ring. Um, leave it out there for those three nights. On the fourth morning, pick it up, go go back, get the ring and get the stone. The yarn that represents the bloodline goes in the fire. Uh, the, the ring you then wear, either around your neck, on your finger, around your anywhere on your body um, for 40 days and nights um, to, to really bind and connect that relationship with grandmother or grandfather. And, um, and then when you're not wearing the ring, it would go on the stone, on the rose quartz. You could sit by your bed or you can even create a, uh, an ancestor shrine where you begin to gather these items. Um, and one note about ancestor shrines, it's good not to put pictures of living people on ancestor shrines. Um, we'd consider that kind of rude. You'd be like bumping them into the other world. <laughs> and, um, and that becomes a place of communication, you know and um, feeling that love and that wisdom and, and support of the ancestors. And the, ideally you could do it for all four of your major lines, but just even to start with one, same ring. If, I, if you were to do all four, you can use the same ring um, and do the same ritual. Um, but that, that's one that I like to suggest to people as far as uh, ritually enacting um, a relationship that you form through journey. Okay with the ancestral helping spirit. I love that. It's really beautiful. If you don't have access to a stream or running water like that, what would you suggest? Um, so the next element that I would work with, um, so when we're talking is to add this piece in, and when you're working with ritual, um, is, is uh, since ritual is the prescriptive response to turmoil as our pharmacies are today 
when you go to the pharmacy to get your medication, you look on the bottle and it says active ingredient somewhere. And it's a big, long word that none of us can say. Um, and <laughs> in ritual, the active ingredients are the elements. So where, when you say, if there's no running water, my mind goes, okay, what elemental medicine could you work with? Well, you could really work with most any of them. Um, you could work with um, earth in which you could do the same ritual uh, with a small earth mound that you create as an earth shrine. Um, and it would be good to do it at the base of a tree. Um, a two trunked tree, ideally. Um, and do the same ritual, just using earth. Um, if you... If you did it in, yeah, I was thinking if you just did it in nature, because most of us can access Earth somewhere. Sure. Um, but uh, those those would be the two elemental energies that I would think of. Fire and, and mineral a little bit different, um, but Earth and water are good for that particular ritual. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And what would you say about anxiety and depression from the, um, I don't know if I want to say ancestral realm, but from that perspective of, of Native American healing, of, of um, ancestral healing, like when it shows up in us, is it something from the ancestors? What would you say about that? That's always the place I look first. Um, that there's, is there some ancestral underpinning to this energy? Mm -hmm. Anxiety. Um, anxiety can be different things. Anxiety is usually, um, my grandmother used to cook with a pressure cooker. I don't know if you've ever seen those little weights that sit on top and it's the pressure build and it start to shake. So anxiety is kind of like that. Something's building, something's shaking. Um, if we, uh, don't know how to take the, the weight off or let the steam out, we just, if we cap it, with drugs or cap it with um, whatever and stop it, it, you know, the pot, I guess, could blow up eventually <laughs> um, or just remain kind of numb and not feel anything. So the idea is anxiety is a kind of a quaking, a waking up that you've come to the, the borderlands or the horizon of an, of an old life um, that you've outgrown. Mm. Um, and the new life that's calling you forward has uh, little concerns for the comforts of the old life. <laughs> so it creates this kind of, you know, am I going to step across this threshold? Um, so anxiety can, can be that. Um, anxiety can be uh, the result of secrecy um, or, or living out of alignment with your medicine. When I talk with the, the, when you come into the world with a particular gift in medicine, to the degree that you move out of alignment with that is to the degree that you're considered in, in a state of turmoil. And when you become back in line with your, your, uh, your medicine, your way of belonging to the world that is innately you, um, that turmoil goes away, or at least the bad trouble. Still get good trouble. Um, so sometimes it's kind of like what kind of what's the flavor of this anxiety? Um, is it a result of disconnection? Um, like I start to examine um, I think in terms of a medicine wheel and the elemental. Where is this? Is this anxiety about um, confusion, inability to take action, inability to receive support, difficulty letting go? Like what is this anxiety about? And therefore, what what ritual response would attend to it? Depression. Um, depression sometimes can be the result of unacknowledged fire and that one is just continually dampened their fire um, and uh, um, and so sometimes fire rituals are the place that we would lean into with depression um, or if it's a uh, or if depression has come from abandonment and, and loss of connection well, I would lean more toward earth rituals. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's more that the state of, uh, the state of emotional wellness of the person, 
um, is responded to elementally in ritual with, with what addresses kind of the root causes. Um, and yes, these things can, uh, as, as in some of the story, that first story, definitely can be the result of unresolved ancestral grief or turmoil or trauma um, that has just and taken up certain little variation forms along the way. Um, Something. See if there's something else I wanted to say about that. That's it. I think it's kind of really if it's anxiety, like what's the form of anxiety and what what would be the ritual response to it or depression? Is it a result of dampened fire or is it a result of loss of connection? Um, and therefore, the ritual response would be a little different to address it. Excellent. Um... Is there anything else you want to add or say or address? Um, I'd like to leave you with a question that I was left with one time um, when I was working with with my with uh, Rocking Bear, and um, and it came after I had given him this long some dream I had, and and uh, again this was it early in the unlearning of my psychologizing of things where I hadn't quite un unlearned all that. And so I was really interested in what, what does all this mean? <laughs> what does all this mean that you and I have talked about today, Dottie? <laughs> um, and he, he listened to that and he said, he said, don't ask what this means. Uh, meaning is like trying to hold water in your hand. It's gonna change. It'll be different next week. Um, ask yourself, based on all that you have heard today in, in our conversation, for those that are listening, ask yourself, what action am I guided to take based on all that I've heard today? And does that act if that action falls within the, the, the boundaries of your integrity, follow it. Um, it's not so important that you um, understand it. Um, Many times you'll get to understand it later once you start doing it, but not always. Sometimes you just take the action. It can be simple. Don't ask, what am I going to do with my life? Ask, you know, what action am I guided to take um, in, when I get home tonight with my children? What action am I guided to take, um, you know, in response uh, to that thing my partner's struggling with? What action? I'm guided to take in, in response to my heart, you know? So this idea that noticing an action that we narrow the gap between what we notice and the uh, deliberate intentional actions we take, um, because we live in a world where we, we like to notice a lot of analysis. And I noticed uh, the screen is not long, wide enough for me to <laughs> plot that out. I tend to fill it up with a lot of meaning. <laughs> uh, and maybe we'll get around the action one day. Or we do impulsive action, which really looks like action to a lot of people, but it's not. <laughs> um, so to, to really center oneself and say, so based on all that I've heard in this, in this talk today, what action am I guided to take? this evening, tomorrow, this week at work, um, and follow it. Let yourself be surprised by yourself, by your own thoughts. I love that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you so much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. I learned a lot, and um, I, feel, I feel peaceful leaving this meeting. So I'm really grateful, Cater. It's been fun, Dottie. Thanks for thanks for the invitation to join you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for accepting. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you soon.